Chapter 1, Part 2 The Theological Disputes of the Ancient Church It is more than probable that the contrast of types would also appear in the history of those schisms and heresies so frequent in the disputes of the early Christian Church. The Ebionites, or Jewish Christians, who in this respect were probably identical with the primitive Christians generally, believed in the exclusive humanity of Christ and held him to be the son of Mary and Joseph, only subsequently receiving his consecration through the Holy Ghost. The Ebionites are, therefore, upon this point, diametrically opposed to the Docetists. The effects of this opposition endured long after. The conflict came to light again in an altered form, which, though essentially attenuated, had in reality an even graver effect upon church politics. About the year 320, in the heresy of Arius, Arius denied the formula propounded by the Orthodox Church, topatri homoousius, that is, like unto the Father. When we examine more closely the history of the great Arian controversy concerning homoousia and homoousia, the complete identity against the essential similarity of Christ with God, it certainly seems to us that the formula of homoousia definitely lays the accent upon the sensuous and humanly perceptible in contrast to the purely conceptual and abstract standpoint of homoousia. In the same way, it would appear to us as though the revolt of the Monophysites who upheld the absolute oneness of the nature of Christ, against the diophysitic formula of the Council of Chalcedon, which upheld the inseparable duality of Christ, namely his human and divine nature fashioned in one body, once more asserted the standpoint of the abstract and unimaginable, as opposed to the sensuous and natural viewpoint of the diophysistic formula. At the same time, the fact becomes overwhelmingly clear to us that, alike in the Arian movement, as in the Monophysite dispute, the subtle dogmatic question, though indeed the main issue for those minds where it originally came to light, had no hold upon the vast majority who took part in the quarrel of dogmas. So subtle a question had even at that time no motive force with the mass, stirred as it was by problems and claims of political power that had nothing to do with differences of theological opinion. If the difference of types had any significance at all here, it was merely because it provided catchwords that gave a flattering label to the crude instincts of the mass. But in no way should this blind one to the fact that, for those who had kindled the quarrel, homoousia and homoousia were a very serious matter, for concealed therein, both historically and psychologically, lay the ebionitic creed of a purely human Christ with only a relative, that is, apparent, divinity, and the docetist creed of a purely divine Christ with only apparent corporeality. And beneath this level again lies the great psychological schism. The one position holds that supreme value and importance lie in the sensuously perceptible, where the subject, though indeed not always human and personal, is nevertheless always a projected human sensation, while the other maintains that the chief value lies in the abstract and extra-human, of which the subject is the function, in other words, in the objective process of nature that runs its course determined by impersonal law, beyond human sensation, of which it is the actual foundation. The former standpoint overlooks the function in favor of the function complex, if man can be so regarded. The latter standpoint overlooks the individual as the indispensable controlling vehicle in favor of the function. Both standpoints mutually deny each other their chief value. The more resolutely the representatives of either standpoint identify themselves with their own point of view, the more do they mutually strive, with the best of intentions perhaps, to obtrude their own standpoint and thereby violate the other's chief value. Another aspect of the type antithesis appears on the scene in the Pelagian controversy in the beginning of the 5th century. The experience so profoundly sensed by Tertullian that man cannot avoid sin even after baptism grew with St. Augustine who in many respects is not unlike Tertullian, into that thoroughly characteristic pessimistical doctrine of original sin, whose essence consists in the concupiscentia inherited from Adam. Over against the fact of original sin, there stood, according to St. Augustine, the redeeming grace of God, with the institution of the Church ordained by His grace to administer the means of salvation. In this conception, the value of man stands very low. He is really nothing but a miserable, rejected creature, who is delivered over to the devil under all circumstances, unless through the medium of the church, the sole means of salvation, he is made a participator of the divine grace. Therewith, to a greater or less degree, not only man's value, but also his moral freedom and self-government crumbled away. As a result, the value and importance of the church as an idea was so much the more enhanced, 
corresponding to the expressed program in the Augustinian Civitas Dei. Against such a stifling conception, springing ever anew, rises the feeling of the freedom and moral value of man. It is a feeling that will not long endure suppression, whether by inspection, however searching, or logic, however keen. The justice of the feeling of human value found its advocates in Pelagius, a monk, and Celestius, his pupil. Their teaching was grounded upon the moral freedom of man as a given fact. It is significant of the psychological kinship existing between the Pelagian standpoint and the diophysistic view that the persecuted Pelagians found asylum with Nestorius, the metropolitan of Constantinople. Nestorius emphasized the separation of the two natures of Christ, in contrast to the Cyrillian doctrine of the physike henosis, the physical oneness of Christ as God-man. Also, Nestorius definitely did not wish Mary to be understood as the Theotokos, that is, Mother of God, but only as Christotokos, that is, Mother of Christ. With some justification, he even called the idea that Mary was Mother of God heathenish. From him originated the Nestorian controversy, which finally ended with the secession of the Nestorian Church. End of section 4. Recording by Olivia.